So um, welcome everybody again. It's our, let's say, second session of uh, the first day of our Womba 2021. And our next speaker is David Goodman from Texas Tech University. So um, as we just discussed, is it's his first talk in Australia. So you're very welcome, David, and please go ahead with your talk. All right, well, uh, thank you very much. It's nice to be uh, remotely in Australia at the minimum. Um, so I'm uh, David Huckleberry Gutman. I do go by Huck. I'm an assistant professor at Texas Tech. Um, today I'm going to be presenting um, some joint work actually with uh, Nam, who's at the University of Sydney. Um, this work has actually recently been accepted to Mathematics of Operations Research. And the crux of it is that we're going to talk about how to generalize coordinate descent type methods to Ramanian manifolds. So uh, here's sort of our roadmap today. Uh, we're going to talk about why we would even care about optimization on manifolds, give you a little bit of motivation. I know in optimization, we may you know, sometimes talk about uh, infinite dimensional spaces, but we don't oftentimes talk about curved spaces, although they're becoming of uh, more interest uh, recently. So we'll, we'll kind of, for those of you who are not in the Ramanian milieu, give a bit of an introduction as to why we would care about that. Then talk about what a Ramanian manifold is. Uh, talk about the elements of optimization that you need for doing optimization on manifolds. Talk about the problem of adapting coordinate descent. And finally, get to the real heart of the talk, which is tangent subspace descent. It is the true generalization of coordinate descent to Ramanian manifolds. So here's sort of the classic problem continuous optimi optimizers are dealing with for minimizing some function f over a convex set that belongs to the effective domain. I mean, the, and the applications of this problem are multitudinous. In LP, you've got production and logistics, quadratic programming, portfolio analysis, you've got modern applications, data science, uh, imaging science, compressed sensing. Um, and for all these applications, this convexity, this convexity assumption is incredibly important. And why do we care about convexity? Well. If I take two points in a set, then the shortest smooth curve between them, a line, uh, lies entirely in the set. So of course, a polyhedron, very convex. The circle, unfortunately, very non-convex. So what's the importance of convexity? Well, I can always move a little bit along the shortest curve from the current point in a cost improving or descent direction. Now, the problem that you have is that some problems of real importance to machine learning, data science, uh, you name it. For example, PCA occur on very non-convex sets like the circle. So here's the fundamental question that happens with optimiz or that comes up in optimization um, on these non-convex. Is it possible to move along shortest curves in cost improving directions on set sets like the circle? And the answer is yes, provided we kind of recast the circle. We want to regard it as what's called a complete Ramanian manifold. Informally speaking, this is something, an object that is locally flat, but possibly very globally curved set of dimension n. And it has a number of really great benefits. So we can talk about smooth functions on these manifolds. We can measure lengths of curves and angles between curves at intersections. And also we do need for at least our treatment today to talk about completeness. Uh, it is the same as the metric sense, but uh, what's really important for us is that the distance between two points on the manifold is equal to the length of the shortest curves, uh, length of the shortest curve between the two points. So the kind of canonical example of a manifold is Earth. Uh, if we're standing here on the ground, looks pretty flat to us. We look at it from space, very, very much curved. And so what do these shortest curves look like? Well. If I take these points in R2, X and Y, the shortest curve on the circle is this. When I recast it as a manifold, I get an arc. Now, more formally, a Ramanian manifold is the following. It's a second countable Hausdorff topological space. We don't care about that so much. Very technical stuff. We'll kind of brush that under the rug. What we really care about is that it's locally Euclidean and smooth. So we have these sort of flat neighborhoods that piece together nicely. This is that local flatness condition. And we have that smooth compatibility of the transition between these flat parts. Sort of technical, but it's what allows us to piece together notions of smoothness and really give us this idea of smooth functions and smooth measurement of lengths of curves and angles. So as I said, what we really wanna do is we wanna be able to move 
in cost improving directions along the shortest curves that sort of point in that directions that direction naturally the question then becomes what directions can you move along at a point in the manifold f and those directions are the directions pointing along or tangent to smooth curves and that set of directions is sort of basically codified by this notion of a tangent space so you take a little curve through your manifold you differentiate it you look at that tangent vector the set of all those vectors gives you those sets of directions so two notes uh one which is very important second which might be well actually which is very important as well so the first one is this is basically a euclidean space it's linearly isomorphic to rn and the second important part which will allow us to define a gradient is that this acts on smooth functions this way which i'm hoping can be seen being highlighted here this will be important for defining a gradient now we do want to move along shortest curves so there's the question of how do we define curve lengths how do we define you know angles at curve intersections the central object that gives us that is a Ramanian metric and this is just a collection of the inner products on the manifold um, and on each tangent space that sort of very smoothly over the manifold itself it allows us to measure lengths and angles between tangent vectors uh, it gives us an induced norm on each tangent space so we can talk about lengths of these vectors um, and it, this is pretty important because it also gives us a, an ability to measure lengths of curves so to measure a length of a curve fairly standard idea you take all these little tangent vectors that sort of point tangent along it and you sum all of their lengths up or looking at this as sort of an infinitesimal object you sum up all the lengths of their tangent curves or tangent vectors so that gives us all of the elements for sort of talking about cost improving directions and lengths of shortest curves but there are a number of elements that are still missing if we want to talk, talk properly about optimization on manifolds um oh well one quick thing to finish up the shortest curve discussion we do have this idea of the geodesic it is the shortest curve if i want to look at the shortest curve that points in a direction v i denote it this way and then i'm parameterizing along with t in rn this is precisely vector translation which is what we would hope it would be um the next element we need though if we want to talk about things like coordinate descent is we need a notion of a gradient and so the gradient is really just this object in each tangent space that gives us directional derivatives so if I think about V as a direction and it gives me an operator that gives me directional derivatives, the gradient is just this thing that when I take the inner product of the gradient with V gives me the directional derivative for F in the direction of V. Okay, so that's a lot about differential manifolds. Um, we sort of have all of the elements we need. We have the shortest curves, we have the notions of cost improving directions, we have gradients. We can now start talking about coordinate descent and an adaptation of it. So in the Euclidean setting, coordinate descent methods, these block decomposable methods are fantastic for hyper large problems. We absolutely love them because they can make a lot of progress before say standard gradient descent can even make a single step. Um, so the question then is when we're dealing with a hyper large dimensional type of minimization problem, can we adapt coordinate descent to minimization on a manifold? The problem we have is that manifolds don't have global Euclidean coordinate systems, right? If you think about the sphere here, there's no global coordinate system for a sphere. It is not a Euclidean space. So I can't just naturally port over my coordinate descent method to the sphere by using some sort of intrinsic coordinates on it. I need to be a little bit more clever about the way I adapt it. So to think about how we might adapt coordinate descent to these globally curved spaces, let's kind of think about what coordinate descent does in Euclidean space. What I basically do is I start off at say an iterate x0. I pick some little coordinate axes, some little subspace at that at that x naught, and then I move along that subspace. 
and I end up here at X1. And then I pick another subspace and using the gradient, I figure out whether I move up or down. And that takes me to the second uh, iterate. And then I pick another one of these little coordinate block subspaces, move along that and I get X3, X4. So what am I doing? Essentially at every iteration, I'm taking this sort of set of coordinate axes, these you know orthogonal subspaces, and I'm dragging them along with me. And I'm picking one either in a cyclic fashion or random. Okay, so if I think about this as sort of dragging these orthogonal projections along with me, it gives me an idea of how to generalize coordinate descent to a Ramanian manifold. So the idea here then is that what I'm essentially in some sense going to do is drag or more generally select orthogonal subspaces at every iteration project the negative gradient onto it, and then move in the direction of the negative gradient. And you can kind of see that here in this picture, which parallels what's going on back here. So I start off at this Y, pick a subspace, project onto it, move in that direction, pick another subspace and move onto it. So what am I doing? At every iteration, I'm picking some little orthogonal subspace, projecting and moving on to it. I'm kind of dragging or selecting these subspaces at every iteration. Now this mode of uh, selecting subspaces, we call a projection selection rule or a subspace selection rule. It's really the heart of the matter in analyzing this thing. Now the convergence analysis, when you do randomized subspace selection is actually really easy, okay? So here, what I'm going to do is every iteration, I'm gonna project onto a random subspace of the tangent space. Now, provided my subspace selection rule follows this sort of bound. Basically, if I think about this randomized norm that's induced by randomly picking subspaces, if it's never, if it's, if it's sort of never too horribly degrades, relative to the ambient Ramanian metric, the Ramanian norm I have, then what I get is very standard convergence rates for this algorithm, provided the objective function is smooth in the standard sense of having an L Lipschitz gradient. So if I have a, what we call a C norm inducing uh, randomized rule, then what I get is one over root T to find a stationary point, and if f is geodesically convex, I get a one over t rate in the expected optimality gap. Now, these are actually seen in a very narrow instance in a previous paper, namely a paper by Shalit and Chechik from uh, 2016, where they do a version of coordinate descent that is specialized only toward the, to the orthogonal group. They don't give a very general analysis. It is a single manifold algorithm. So, if I present randomized rules, there's a very natural question here of can I do deterministic rules and get deterministic guarantees, right? Random, randomized is great, but we do love deterministic as well. This analysis gets really interesting. Um, and the reason it gets interesting is I kind of want to do something where I'm cycling over subspaces but two tangent spaces can have very different structures. If you think about what's going on with the sphere, right? Tangent space North Pole looks a lot different than the tangent space at the equator. I can't really just say, hey, these subspaces may are the same thing as what's going on up here, right? So what ends up happening is I have to account for the fact that I need to do what's called parallel transport on the manifold. And that's where I start dragging tangent vectors along curves in parallel fashions in a parallel fashion along these curves. And this causes a lot of sort of weird twisting. And you can see what ends up happening here on the sphere when I do this drag. Let's say I start off with this little vector right here. I drag it in parallel along the curve, this curve from A to B. Then I drag that vector in a parallel fashion from B to the North Pole. Then I drag it in parallel from the North Pole down to A. I end up here. So even though I was dragging in a parallel fashion, it looked to me like a if I were a bug on these curves, it looks like that vector isn't moving. 
by moving along this broken, what we call geodesic, I end up actually inducing a lot of twist. And that becomes a real issue when you're dealing with the cyclic setting. So to get around that, we need another sort of norm condition that's akin to what we did in the randomized setting. And basically we need this new norm that we induce to not degrade too horribly ran, uh, relative to the Ramanian metric. And essentially what this condition we have, this degradation condition we have on norm says is if I'm parallel transporting in a small ball, then the twisting isn't too bad. And I can kind of do this cyclic type deterministic rule. Now, this is a very technical condition. You know, I don't want to pay too much attention to it, but basically all it's saying is if you don't move too far, the twisting isn't terrible. And when your projection selection rule satisfies that, if you have your very nice standard L Lipschitz sort of gradient and you take your step size equal to one over L, then again, you get a very standard sort of convergence rate. So you have that the gradients go down to zero at a rate of one over root T, an M does appear over here. And if F is geodesically convex, which is just a generalization of convexity or Romanian manifold, then the suboptimality gap decreases in a deterministic sense at the rate of one over T. Now there are some wrinkles that do pop up here. So one, you do have this C factor here that sort of accounts for how much of that twisting pops up. And you also have this R squared term here. And that R measures basically how far you're moving because again, the intuition for why this works is if I don't move too far, the twisting isn't too bad. So this is all very nice and all, but there is uh, the question of what manifolds can I actually practically do this on, right? I mean, so far I'm giving you theory, is this realistic in any setting besides Rn? And in fact it is, and which is really what makes this kind of cool. So one of the really neat settings that we give is the Stiefel manifold. And this is just a set of uh, all N by P matrices with orthonormal columns. And the key insight here is that you wanna decompose the tangent space in just the right way to get very efficient updates. So here's how we, we define it. And uh, here are the subspaces we break this down into. And we give two different types of rules. So you can either, at every iteration, randomly pick one of these ij's or j's, or you can cycle through them over the iterates. Um, now, what the, you might ask why we picked basically these, this decomposition? And that's a great question. It is sort of the heart of the matter if you actually want to have efficient updates. Well, what ends up happening is with this choice of subspaces, when you plug the projection onto, you know, of the negative gradient onto one of these subspaces into the exponential map, you get a really nice update. It really is almost like a rank one update which is what exactly what you would want if you're doing coordinate descent, right? Coordinate descent updates only a block of coordinates. We would expect that if I'm doing this on a matrix manifold, I want to have a rank sort of one update type idea. And that's exactly what we have. So uh, there is a specialized version of this rule, but just in the randomized setting and only on the orthogonal manifold, which is a special case of this. Uh, again, that's the Shallot and Chechik paper. Okay. so. This does appear in practice. Sparse PCA is a very famous problem that occurs on the, uh, on the Stiefel manifold. Uh, basically, you have some set of data here and uh, you form this matrix A that has these rows. Then what you end up getting is this problem over the Stiefel manifold. Um, X is the Stiefel, you know, uh, the Stiefel, uh, the element of the Stiefel manifold you're picking. And you can see here that the percent of gaps, the gap, uh, optimality gap closed for this problem over the cycles elapsed. Well, if you go compare cycles to one iteration of gradient descent, we're closing stuff a lot faster, a lot of that optimality gap faster than uh, gradient descent, which is also what you see 
in the Euclidean setting. So we do have very nice numerics to back all of this up. So finally, uh, some future work and directions. Clearly, everything that I've talked about really only applies in a deterministic setting. There isn't anything for stochastic optimization. That's one of the uh, basically future directions. The next question is acceleration of, sort of gradient-based methods on Ramanian manifolds. Now, we know very recently, I think as recently as this last week, that acceleration in its full form is actually not feasible on a Ramanian manifold. So there's the question of how you actually hit the optimal rate and what that optimal rate is. Uh, there's also the question of how to do higher order derivative methods. And finally, one item that I didn't include here is how do we actually create projection selection rules on other manifolds of interest? Other manifolds we might care about would be the flag manifold and the positive definite manifold. So with that, I thank you very much for uh, your time and attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you very much, David. So uh, I guess we still have we have quite a lot of time for questions. So does anybody have any questions? Uh, Bethany? Oh no, sorry, that was just was that was just uh, uh, Lyndon. Yeah. Hi, David. Thanks. Um, this is really interesting. I guess I was thinking in terms of generating projections that work well and so on. And something that I've been looking at in some of my work is where using things like Johnson, Linden, Strauss type embeddings, you can kind of get high probability guarantees of embedding. Essentially, I've had conditions that look very similar to your gradient type conditions. So given that tangent spaces, you say, have this, I don't know, it was isomorphism to Rn or whatever the kind of connection was. Could you use those sorts of randomized projections in this setting? Um, so using the randomized projection from uh, Johnson Linden Strauss and sort of this, for instance, yeah, these sorts of things, um, you can get those gradient embedding type conditions. Yes, so I can give you sort of an off the hip, you know, uh, shooting from the hip answer to that. Um, could you use that, and would it ensure the condition? Absolutely. Um, you know, we we actually have looked at very similar things, uh, not exactly the Johnson Linden Strauss ideas, but very similar things in our paper, um, or at least closely related. Now, the real issue you're gonna have is that will work in ensured uh, convergence. When you project onto those sub, the negative gradient onto those subspaces and you plug it into the exponential map, there is no guarantee you're going to have a very nice exponential map update, okay? So sort of respecting the structure of the exponential map is really key if you want um, an efficient implementation. So will it ensure convergence? Yes. Will it necessarily give you something that's really implementable and nice? Not necessarily. Uh, one way though, possibly around that, and I actually don't mention this as a uh, sort of a direction of generalization, but it is one we're going to look at, is instead of moving around on the manifold using the exponential map, you can move around on the manifold using something more general known as a retraction. Now, I think using that sort of randomized uh, subspace selection with a retraction, that I could see working really well because those are built to give sort of more efficient updates in various contexts. Okay, great. That's uh, really interesting. I've got one other question if anyone else has their hand up, which is, I guess, in coordinate descent, there's this famous kind of, uh, let's say counterexample result from PAL, where if you do kind of high quality line searches, you can end up in cycles and not converge. Do you suspect anything would hold true in the manifold case? Would you get these degenerate sort of cases? Ooh, um, I see no, no reason why you wouldn't, right? Uh, because, well, we do have it on our end and our end is sort of like the easy manifold. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you could end up getting some really, you probably could get some really neat counterexamples with that, right? I would think probably some settings where some things could go really wrong would be like hyperbolic space. Um, that seems to be the space that gives rise to all sorts of trouble as we found out in the last week. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think you could probably get some really neat stuff kind of going there. Okay, great, thanks. Um, are there any more questions? 
Just say we have questions and unmute yourself and start talking. It looks like I may be lucky again and uh, I may be able to ask my questions. So I'm the, the, the last priority as a chair, right? So um, I have I have kind of maybe a silly question again. So there is, um, because I come from a different um, area, right? So there's an um, outlook say on interior point methods, right? The way you explain interior point methods, especially in Renegar's book on interior point method is that you kind of think about the Euclidean space as, uh, or at, of a convex set as something that has a different metric in a sense, right? You have a different inner product uh, that is related to every point. So I'm wondering if there's any benefit or you, if you have any example in which it's beneficial to actually consider some uh, problem that is actually on the RN on Euclidean space, but is there any benefit in treating it as a manifold with a different non-standard metric and structure? Um, so that's a great question. Now, in talking about RN and changing its geometry, um, I, I can't think of a problem off the top of my head, but um, I can tell you that more generally, people are very interested in changing this Ramanian metric uh, to basically get better convergence rates, get many better properties on different manifolds. So for example, there are two different geometries on the set of positive definite matrices that we really care about. One is where the Ramanian metric is inherited from basically the trace metric. Mm -hmm. And that, that comes from the fact that we can think of the PD manifold as this sort of quotient. Um, mm -hmm. The other one is this information metric that the statisticians have cooked up, um, and it tends to enforce certain properties that they they like a great deal. I, I'm not personally a statistician, so I don't quite know what they had in mind when they built that. But that change of geometry to mm -hmm. uh, exploit some benefit from an algorithmic or a statistical standpoint is certainly something that's done. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, just to add to that, I think uh, the example Huck brought up, uh, there was uh, some sort of, there was a problem which was non-convex if you look at the traditional geometry, but if you change the geometry uh, on the positive definite uh, matrices and it becomes geodesically convex. I'm not sure if Huck mentioned that mm -hmm. term in his talk, uh, but you know, you get some nice convexity and, and uh, convergence if you change the uh, geometry for that particular problem. Um, yeah, so there is an example where where there is a tangible benefit, yeah. Nice, I, I've seen actually this kind of stuff going on, but not even an optimization. So it's yeah, it's obviously a very nice uh, <laughs> hack. <laughs> Change the geometry, uh, right? And um, end up with a convex set and convex function. Okay, thank you so much, David. So I hope that you will continue giving talks in our Australian optimization event. <laughs>